but we sometimes lack to find the true ways to reach our buyers and on so many occasions we follow the same routes to achieve our goals and do not receive the level of success times are changing my friends and we must also explore new avenues to find resources to explore and to follow we have an illustrious panel today and i shall introduce the same to start with we have chirag parekh an eminent young personality schooled in london graduated from new york chirag entered the diamond industry in 2008 he got his hands on training in his factory he slowly learned to manage the jewelry factory and all it takes to actually run it successfully chirag also entered into the online sale of diamonds in the name of janamcorp.com his company has a rough manufacturing facility at turbe mr parekh with his strong business acumen international exposure tremendous wisdom and sound management skills has set sound at janam corporation on a sound growth path today chirag is also part of the bdb committee in mumbai we have also with us chandra prakash d siroya shri chandu bhai siroya as he is well known uh, is the md of siroya jewelers llc one of dubai's dynamic companies he has vast experience in manufacture wholesale and the retail of jewelry the siroyas are the recipient of the award of the highest importer of gold jewelry from india into the middle east for 2019 and have been the highest importer of indian jewelry for continuously 12 years siroya jewelers have also been awarded the guinness world record for the manufacture of the world's longest handmade gold chain which man which measured 5.52 kilometers for the dubai gold and jewelry group during the dubai shopping festival in 2015 Mr Seroya is also the vice chairman of the Dubai Gold and Jewelry Group. He has been a very active member of the board since the past 26 years. Mr Seroya is also a member of the Dubai Gold Advisory Group at the DMCC and has been a speaker at various gold conferences. He is actively involved with the Jain community of Dubai and he is also the IPP of Jito in Dubai. We have with us another young and dynamic ankit gala ankit's grandfather started the jewelry business in 1977 and it was established as valapsi malsian company in 1981 in mumbai his family has been active as a manufacturer exporter wholesaler retailer and an importer of gold and diamond jewelry one of the top 3 gold jewelry exporters from india since 1994 recognized by the government of india as a three star export house status holder preferred supplier to many reputed retailers in india and many traditional jewelers across the world he offers a comprehensive range of 22 carat jewelry as well as 18 carat diamond studded jewelry of the highest standards the next panelist is mr sunil agarwal He is the MD of Vibhav Global Limited. He is an MBA from Columbia University, New York. He is an entrepreneur with professionally managed vertical business model, manufacturing sourcing units in India, China, Thailand, and Indonesia. He is among the first Indian companies keenly involved in the marketing on television and on e-commerce e ch retail channels in the US and the UK. we have another uh, personality mr ashish shah who belongs to the great family of satish bhai shah who was called the churchill of the indian diamond world he is his company gold star continues to make new strides under his able supervision and guidance as md of the company ashish bhai started his career as a diamond sorter and rose from his ranks to become the md of gold star this has enabled him to understand the nuances of the complete business right from the grassroots that is the production stage he is responsible for the key manufacturing 
manufacturing and distribution and international sales and is the driving force behind the building a diverse workforce at gold star uh, the moderator for today is mr hemant shah for this panel hemant bhai as we all know is an iit graduate with great understanding and knowledge of the gem and jewelry industry of over more than 25 30 years he is a creator of ideas he is a big creator of thought processes and he can bring in tremendous value to any concept that you can come up with he is also a revivalist of some of the unique and cultural dying arts of india for example the bidri axe and many other dying uh, many other indian old arts we have 90 minutes for this uh, webinar totally and and we would request for a few minutes for questions and answers so i hand over to hemant bhai to begin his webinar thank thank you ashok bhai thank you for the wonderful introduction of the panelists you know what it has done to me i am so glad that you can only see my top half otherwise is sitting in such of an awesome panel you would have seen my knees and my leg shivering <laughs> so thank you very much and welcome to all the panelists it is really a pleasure to have all of you here and the topic today as we all know is the future and the changing scenario of exports however what we did when we were making the panel we said let us have three exporters from india from the three different fields but let us also have two importers who would be able to give us insights into what we as exporters should be doing in the future Indian gem and jewelry industry has always been a leader when it comes to creating new business opportunities. How this industry became so famous, so popular, and so dominant in the global arena today is when our ancestors started cutting near gem quality stones. so well that they could be sold as gem quality stones and this is where india started its foray into the international gem and jewelry industry today over 90% of the global diamonds come from india directly indirectly that doesn't matter but we control everything and we also know that as a business we have been growing continuously and from the smaller and inexpensive stones diamonds we have today reached a stage where we cut polish market the larger and the high value diamonds also when we talk of jewelry diamond studded jewelry actually came into play predominantly as a vertical integration for the diamond industry however from being just a hot house for manufacturing maybe about 20 years back at that time all we used to do is to wait for our customers to come they would come with a mold they would come with a design at uh, times they would come with a sample and we would make it at a far better uh, price which gave them far more value than what the other countries where they used to at that time manufacture give them. but today 20 years down the line the gem the jewelry industry in india has had their creative and specially their quality improvement juices flowing so well that today we in our own right are creators of high quality both in terms of the physical manufacturing quality as well as the design of ourselves we have become leaders and trust me i do not believe there is any market today that can really exist in the kind of glory that they are existing in without the support of the indian gem and jewelry talking of gold jewelry that has been a tradition in india i mean there is no way that anybody can think of gold and jewelry the two words together without bringing india into the current scenario okay predominantly selling handmade handcrafted 
which is an art in India, by the way, handcrafted jewelry, we focus mainly on the Indian styling. So we have Meenakari jewelry, we have Jadao jewelry, we have temple jewelry, we have great Indian designs, integrate flowers, integrate, uh, integrate mango shapes, and everything that you can think of. And we are by far a huge player to reckon with in that space of playing with. What we want to do today is to hear from our panel how can things or how the future is going to look like and how the scenarios are changing over the past few years. Although we predominantly today talk and focus on the pandemic and its effects, actually in reality, the German jewelry industry for a few years, even before the pandemic, has been having challenging times. And what we want to hear today from this panel is how they had planned to address those challenges, how they are planning to address it going forward, and how they see India getting the glory and retaining its supremacy in the gem and jewelry category. Having said that, let me start with my first question, which is addressed to all the three exporters. Okay. Uh, on an absolute scale, as I just mentioned, even before the pandemic, we were having challenges and the global gem and jewelry demand had been on the downturn. What do you feel is the way that we can go forward? What had you planned at that time? And considering the current pandemic, what are the kind of changes you expect within the framework of the export market to tap international customers? And uh, how do you see yourself going forward? I think I'd like Chirag to answer that question first. I'm going to take you through the pipeline. Right. Uh, thank you, Evan. Uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, I think as uh, Ashok Bhai mentioned that I joined the uh, business in 2008, and that time we had, I mean, at least I already saw the global meltdown that happened. Um, so it was already tough uh, getting the, into the diamond industry, and things were not as easy as what we what earlier people I'd seen. Um, so as I started uh, with my blues, uh, coming to my blues diamonds office, um, I think uh, straight away I felt that uh, going online, uh, you know, being transparent to the customers is, is very important in uh, today's world. So from day one, uh, building the website and so technologically uh, we were get, I was getting more hands-on uh, in terms of uh, you know attracting the clients and um, I mean we've seen also since uh, last in last especially in last five six years that a lot of online platforms have come I mean Rapnet has been wrap up has been there since a long time, but uh, you know, James Allen, IDEX Online, uh, you know, and a few new players that are there right now, like Get Diamonds and Market Dot Diamonds, Nevada. So you know, so I think uh, a lot of uh, my focus was also physically, also exhibitions were important, but also with that uh, technology that. Uh, was very helpful in terms of uh, expanding the business, reaching the customers, uh, you know, going to clients that I wouldn't have probably gone physically to meet. You know, so online, online made it very easier for us to uh, catch up with the clients. So, yeah. Okay. Ankit, uh, can you take uh, the question next? Uh, I go to a company, sure. Chirag, um, and later to Ashish. Sure. Um, so, uh, as like Chirag, um, I also joined the business right uh, during the Lehman crisis. Um, and luckily, my platform was a lot more um, uh, easier because we were the leading uh, exporters since 94. 
So I joined in 2008. The major difference that I felt was the customers used to come um, from, let's say, US, Dubai, UK to our offices, uh, you know, till about 2007. But post that, uh, there was a disruption for about a year or so in the export industry. So um, what we understood was that, uh, as he said that we were going, to, they went online. We did a lot of video conferencing. So a lot of customers didn't want to. Um, you know, come or uh, they were not very, um, uh, new customers were not very saying, if I'm traveling so much, what if your product is not good or whatever. Um, so we were doing a lot more video conferencing, a lot more FaceTiming. Um, so uh, live uh, streaming and showing on them our collections. So uh, that helped us in terms of, uh, you know, gaining back um, people who had stopped coming to us for two years, for the, uh, example, during the crisis. And uh, in fact, gave us a lot more strength to get other customers on board post that. So from 2010 to 16, it was another very strong drive for us um, in the export market um, to get a lot more customers uh, than we already had um, in, in, the, in the last few years before the, the crisis. And also that uh, because of the gold prices were rising during that time, um, it, there was, uh, it went from almost from $1,000 to $1,900. Then obviously it did a crash come in uh, 2013. But we also had to improvise on a lot more uh, uh, lightweight items, uh, a lot more daily wear items in terms of the younger generation. So, you know, what we, what we do, unlike diamond jewelry, for gold jewelry, we cater to a lot of NRIs uh, uh, because there's a lot more traditional, uh, uh, you know, aesthetics in the, in the, in the designs. Um, so we had to make sure that we also um, get the younger generation, which obviously uh, was now born, born in America to get used to the gold jewelry wearing. So we had to do that in terms of designing and styling. Um, so you know, mix of these two uh, got us back on track for the uh, post the crisis or post after I joined. So you know what? It's like you had a you had a calling saying that okay, you're going to need the same technology twelve years down the line, and in two thousand and twenty, it's all back about video conference. Exactly, like, exactly. Yeah. So, so luckily, we, we you know we have that in place, so it makes it a lot more easier easier for us now because we already have been doing that. So we need to start doing that for the domestic market as well now. Absolutely, I quite agree with you. Ashish, what is your take on that? You are a mix of gold and jewelry, but you are not in the kind of gold jewelry that uh, Ankit would be really be the one who is going around selling. What is your take? How have you seen the whole scenario? Good evening, Heaven Bhai, and good evening to all. Uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, my take is that, uh, you know, I would bifurcate this question into two parts. First is before pandemic. So in really, yeah, in the whole world, the diamond jewelry uh, retail sales has been dropping in terms of the top line numbers. However, we at Gold Star, uh, we had some aggressive strategies in place. And actually, last three years, we have been growing double digit growth year on year. And wow. that was something that uh, started when uh, about three and a half years back, Gold Star management wanted to uh, push some aggressive buttons and wanted to cover the market shares and we had the strategies in place in terms of what we are going to do, how we are going to have a retail counter showcase space and we actually went upscale into our product line. So our average FOB or per value uh, FOB of the each unit was raised up uh, along with better diamond qualities and also uh, we had a co-license agreement that we signed in with two big bridal brands. And we took the worldwide distribution, manufacturing and distribution of the bridal jewelry. Identifying that bridal jewelry is going to be always there. Bread and butter or daily wear jewelry, there were losing of margins, there were dropping of price points. CVD lab grown was coming. We all realized that even three years back, it was there on that. So bridal jewelry, we identified as a forte. And we pushed that button at that time. And we were fortunate enough to get a lot of counter cookie spaces. Uh, with the two big, big brands that we acquired for, co-licensing agreement we did for, and we upscale our diamond jewelry uh, 40 in that. 
obviously along with investments in technology improvisation in processes implementation of lean six sigma manufacturing to cut down unnecessary fats etc that helped the company to grow uh, tremendously over the last three years so definitely that is something that has been there and if we wouldn't have this pandemic probably we would have continued this journey of growth now it's like a pause time we are revisiting uh, what we have implemented uh, what needs to be next in terms of coming years to come at the same time and th and that's that's something that uh, implementation if the thoughts are on and the implementation is also going to be on going digital will be the new way etc etc digital space is going to get overcrowded yes absolutely and nobody is going to be able to live without it yeah now my next question is this considering the pandemic everything i read about and even my personal experiences with the various consultants that i do both within india and in the predominantly in the us everybody is talking of a dynamic shift in the consumer preferences and spending levels after the pandemic i would like first the people who are on the floor who are facing consumer to answer this question and i would ask sir, sunil ji uh, if you can please give us your take on this sure himan bhai uh, so thank you for having me here so initially when uh, pandemic hit in us in march uh, we are predominantly b2c we actually 99% b2c company uh through television and ecom in us and uk and uh, last 5 years we've been experiencing double digit growth consistently but as soon as pandemic hit in march our return rates uh jumped up almost double than what we had before because people were nervous right. and wanted to uh, you know not pay the credit card bills uh and they could return so they return but in april uh, onwards april may june and even july we are seeing our growth rate really jump high so it used to be 15% 17% growth now we are experiencing almost 30% growth because people are staying home people have time and also they are searching through web and television both so we uh, we sort of benefited of the pandemic the price points we saw initially uh, in april and early part of may people were going for lower price points and when the uh, stimulus money came in we saw, started seeing high price point also selling the diamonds and the higher price point gemstones uh, 18 karat gold platinum they started to sell well that time so our return rates uh, went down because of lockdowns people didn't return product much so uh, in a way we uh, we saw change, uh, rapid changes in the marketplace Uh, from high returns to low returns low price point to high price point and we expect to uh, see the continued elevated uh, performance till the time that there is a lockdown uh, con continuing and even after lockdown with the changes that we put in place we expect to see uh, decent double digit growth for years to come congratulations and all the best to you uh, chandubai I would like your take on the same question. What do you think is the effect of the pandemic on the consumers' buying choices? Uh, uh, first of all, uh, very good uh, good evening to all our viewers and listeners today, uh, and Anamashkar. Uh, I am not so much directly cons uh, consumer oriented business. I am a wholesaler mainly, so I can tell you from the point of view of the whole uh, the retail jewelers. Yeah. You see, uh, rather than the retail, as we have heard already, three experts talk about the diamond jewelry. But uh, when it comes to the Middle East market and uh, the uh, gold retailers, uh, there is a little bit of uncertainty. You see, uh, what is happening here uh, in the Middle East, especially, is that uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, people who have lost their jobs. Uh, we don't have too many uh, uh, local population. Our population is mostly expatriates uh, from different countries. and that is true for almost all the uh, middle east countries and um, due to this uncertainty of the jobs uh, people have started uh, trying to conserve whatever monies they have and gold being uh, one of the uh, discretionary purchases uh, is uh, 
the first to be hit and that is the reason we are not seeing too much sales at the retail level uh, having said that uh, last month uh, in the end of june we had a uh, fantastic sales in saudi arabia because uh, saudi arabia implemented 15% vat uh, which was 5% up to 30th of june and from 1st of july it is 15% so there was a big uptake and uh, many of the retailers in uh, saudi have already sold up all their stocks so there is a good demand right now but uh, unfortunately the flights are still not operational and uh, we are still in a lockdown situation as far as international travel is concerned see uh, dubai is very very proactive and i think the government here did a fantastic job uh, we are having a negative uh, growth in the virus uh, uh, from 15000 infected people today we are down to almost only 7500 or 7800 infected people in the country so they have controlled it very well they have opened all the airports uh, but uh, uh, tourist flights are still not coming so as soon as tourism starts uh, you know people will be coming back to dubai because this is their preferred destination for uh, sourcing their jewelry see dubai is unique because here in one building or in uh, a couple of buildings you can find jewelry made in almost every manufacturing center in the world so you know in anybody be it america be it uk be it uh, australia anywhere they can find their choice and they can find the choice in all their characters 18 carat 21 carat 22 carat and now even 14 carat ready made jewelry is available plus even diamond jewelry is available so i think it's a matter of time uh, Uh, maybe a few months more and uh, things wa- will start getting a little normal i cannot say normal normal we can expect maybe in the next 12 months but uh, not before definitely plus uh, there is a little bit of increase in the gold price so again gold has become expensive and being a discretionary purchase people are still taking a pause maybe they want to wait and watch so all in all our uh, business is a little, little depressed but the spirits are high that's great as long as the spirit is there everything will work Uh, let me now go to ankit ankit uh, how do you see your plain gold jewelry export in the current scenario and in the future considering not only the price factor but even the after effects of the pandemic um so i think uh, uh, in terms of exports i um, with the stimulus packages that uh, the us and uk have given uh, the uh, there has been um, uh, a good solid demand coming in um, obviously it is to do with uh, let's say a lighter weight items but uh, i think the only focus that you got to do with the gold prices rising um, and also the euph- euphoria of gold that is going to go to let's say you know 2400 dollars or whatever people are talking about Uh, that is also getting to the salary uh, uh, individual. Uh, so those are also um, you know getting in um, to buy jewelry. So the only thing as as uh, uh, exporters and manufacturers, what we can do is just concentrate on what you can do with a lot more lighter and western. Obviously, you have your uh, classic Indian style to it. but you know, if you stick to it too much uh, the 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 younger generation abroad even though they are indians are not liking it too much so the only thing that you are to concentrate is make sure that you make it a lot more western and at the same time uh, you can't lose your handmade touch to it um, because then it becomes a general italian product you got to make sure that it's made in india it has the uh, it has the culture but at the same time it can be wearable so that's something that you got to concentrate on and otherwise i think uh, there is demand we need to just to cater it in the right manner you just preempted an answer to the next thing i was going to ask you is that are we as indians capable of making the italians run for their money uh, okay. not not directly not directly but but in a sense that if you create a fashion of of something that you can still have that uh, uh, cultural touch at the same time uh, the aesthetics of the design can look western which is a very tricky thing uh, but over time and experience i think you can honestly uh, get there and and understand uh, uh, what you need to do so i won't say give them run for the money but rather uh, keep pace with them in a different category or vertical Uh, Hemant, can I add something here? Yes, of course, Sindhu Bhai. 
as as a person who is sitting outside i think as india if uh, the policies are correct and if we can encourage the manufacture of jewelry i don't think there is any jewelry in the world which we cannot manufacture absolutely i i we have no, the no, so i i agree the same thing as well yeah. i'm just we saying the best that artisans, the handmade we, sector yeah, no, no 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 not only handmade i say we have the best artisans we have the best bra- brains when it comes to even technology it is our people who are operating the machines in many places also. agreed agreed okay agreed. so agreed. if if we get the government support which is required we get the institutional support Uh, which is uh, being given to other countries uh, in in other countries. For example, in Turkey, you see, Turkey there was uh, manufacturing was very very low, and today it has become almost uh, equal or maybe has already replaced uh, Italy in some ways. Why? Because the government is very proactive. There is a lot of incentives given to the manufacturers for export. You know, I don't know whether all of us are aware or not. Uh, oh, yeah. The Turkish Borsa. gives almost 50 to 80% of the cost of your exhibitions outside the country for exports so you see uh, it is it is a very good government support now if we can get a similar support as india i think we can beat any country when it comes to manufacture of our jewelry you know you give one piece of our meenakari jewelry to italian and say can you please make this they'll quote you 50 dollars and still they won't get it so we have the best skill i think we are under utilizing our skill go right on this point chandu bhai i'd like to point out one thing it's a personal mm-hmm. thing i run a mm-hmm. company called alcraft test where okay. i make jewelry using various indian crafts like dokra bidri paper uh-huh. mate etc and now we are working on tarakashi and wood carving also wow and we make very modern designs using those traditional crafts and we met with tremendous success and you know what is the best part of it chandu bhai and i think all of us should take a note of this and try to work along those lines is that because such things cannot be made in any other country i have no price competition yes i agree with you i that's, agree with that's you that's one of the big advantages but here you see if you had support from some yeah, of course uh, of course marketing for marketing your that greater it would have been exponential yes. i i definitely agree with you uh, ashish i'd like you to answer this question but with you i want it with a certain twist you are one of those guys who has started with manufacturing modern western jewelry and then as i said in the year 2000 when everybody started you also got into manufacturing jewelry for the indian market how are you going to address your export business and if possible create niches for yourself i know you guys have solid plans and i don't expect you to share all of it but give us an insight give us a teaser teaser so to say so hemant bhai right now we are facing kind of two challenges obviously one is pandemic and uh, the uh, pocket share or the consumer money uh, we, we are not very uncertain you know as sunil ji said uh, the temporary stimulus packages has come in united states and uh, uk and at the same time consumer is spending money based on the revenge shopping kind of a say at the moment how long this will last will be a question uh we see that the current surge of demand uh, will continue till uh, july end or let's say august and after that it will settle down when the actual reality of the us economy comes in play wherein the consumer now has to go to work and still make money for themselves and with the rising unemployment rates i do not know where they are going to get that kind of money. with this challenge uh, one side at the same time we also see a great opportunity because uh, gold prices has gone up we see that the consumer returning the products back to the pawn shops etc they will have still their money left and their consumer confidence will be back in the gold okay and based on that uh, obviously we are launching some of the new collections uh, the product development is in pipeline because based on the current gold prices we had to retweak the jewelry that we used to so normally in a kind of a depression we would have gone to basic kind of a scenario we go back to basic and sell bread and butter items instead of it we have taken a little different turn and we are launching a big collections in terms of uh, which is kind of a combo of a product mix where it brings aesthetics along with a great perceived value using the technology so that is going to be the key driving factor for us as far as the coming years to come at least for next 12 months to come i would say that because next 3 or 4 months is going to be still challenging at the moment but assuming uh, we have some kind of a better cure available as for this uh, virus is concerned consumer confidence will be back life will start coming back to normal and that's what my take would be uh chirag uh, i have the same question but along a little different line 
that you are, I'm not talking about your jewelry business, but I'm talking about your diamond business, where you are having a certain set of products. Now, how are you using your own resources at jewelry or with other uh, people to whom you are vendors to create a product that is going to be successful post the pandemic? In, in terms of the news? Uh, in terms of the news, yes. I mean, uh, um, see, as uh, you know, Mr. Sunil said, and I think even Ashish by mentioned that uh, you know, in in in, in US, uh, you know, bridal jewelry is is always going to be in demand. I mean, even if we see during pandemic, I'm I'm hearing there are still engagements happening, weddings happening. You know, the 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 life is moving on. The demand is there. So I think, uh, I mean, what I see is that uh, in, in terms of loose, the demand will be there. The, 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 the demand will never die. It's just, uh, you know, I mean, what people were buying, example, one carrot, they'll go down to 70 pointer or 80 pointer or 90 pointer, depends on, depend on their, you know, uh, budget. But, uh, and I think uh, also uh, in terms of uh, demand, I, don't, I, I, I think uh, I see, I see uh, US to be, I mean, even before pandemic, it was, yes, it was a little slow, but I don't, I don't uh, see US market in, in particular to be uh, as bad. Um, I think that is what you are asking right hey, Manbet? so what i want to know is that or let's see i have this theory that uh, because of the pandemic i would expect that every stage of the pipeline to right. hold hands better than they have been doing in the past right that is where my question was directed to you okay how are you as a base raw material supplier of polished diamonds going to work with your jewelry manufacturers or even with your retailers whom you sell some of your diamonds directly to grow this business i mean uh, as we as i i mentioned in your first question you know to online uh, doing business online right now at this even during pandemic and especially post pandemic i feel online business uh, you know is I think Mr. Sunil said that they have a tele shopping channel as uh, I mean they, they do supply on tele shopping as well. So I mean that is a that is a very good business in US. That it, it I mean it's not as successful as it is in US uh, in India. So I think online it has to be from I mean uh, customizing jewelry, uh, giving option to clients to customize jewelry. So from you know, choosing a diamond to the design of the ring. So, so everything has to be channelized in a particular way so that the client is, doesn't have to, you know, the, he doesn't have to leave the comfort of his home and still, still do the same business that he, he's doing by actually visiting the physical store. Okay. Now, the next question I'm asking you, I want all of you all to answer me that. But do you believe that today is a stage? And okay, I'm making a statement first, which I don't know, which is highly debatable. But I would believe that India controls and financially supports a huge chunk of the global jewelry business at various stages of the pipeline. Now, considering that, do you think this is the time for the Indian exporter, Indian manufacturer, Indian diamond tear? working with their importing partners to create D2C, direct-to-consumer brands from India and go ahead and push themselves or partner with retailers across the world to go ahead and push themselves as their product with their name tag rather than just being a back-end manufacturer. Uh, Ashish, let me start with you on this question. So, Eman Bhai, uh, your point is very valid. 
and something that is what we identify but creating a d2c brand sitting in india itself is a huge challenge and in terms of the financial commitment as well and that's where goldstar partnered with the uh, successful bridal brands uh, 3 years back and created uh, and both of them are you know the name is very no, uh, known in the industry called zecos and monique lilier they both are very successful bridal brands and we co license with them by taking their licenses and push on the retail counter that this is the brand they need to carry along with our jewelry mm-hmm. so earlier we were also selling bridles but those bridles were obviously selling like a generic skews and uh, it was at the mercy of the retailer whether to carry or not to carry or when the skew dies etc but with these two brands uh, we are pushing that on the retail counter so i feel that is a better option that we have opted for instead of creating our own uh, d2c brand and probably we will consider doing the third brand as well in near by future also on the similar lines great uh, ankit what is your take on this um, so again uh, uh, not like ashish bhai uh, you know we are not very um, uh, international in terms of our customer base uh, and you stick to our nris or rather south east asian including bangladesh and you know, pakistanis and, and sri lankans uh, what we have done in uh, in the last 25 years of export is uh, create a brand of our own in terms of uh, you know vmc products or or so on so so forth so we partner with a lot of wholesalers across the world um, and also retailers but now what happens is you can't cater to all retailers uh, in the us so um, that's the reason i you know cater to the wholesalers and over time we've understood from them uh, that what we need to do to kind of tap for them to tap other retailers and in that sense what we've done is with the constant product that we've uh, manufactured uh, the retailers that do not get our products uh, uh, in turn tells the wholesalers that we need vmc products so indirectly what you are saying uh, that gives a larger scheme of things but we are doing that at a very smaller level uh, in terms of the south east asian customers i feel so do you believe there is an opportunity to expand that there is okay. there is there is and and and, and you know yeah, just make sure that you hit at it a lot harder than i have done before maybe okay chandu bhai okay you as one of the largest exporters importers from india do you see the indian export unity where you can you know create strategic alliances with them to go this route yeah but definitely you see um, i think as i said earlier our jewelry is unique and uh, there is always going to be a demand for it it is a matter of time uh, we as seroya jewelers have uh, aligned with uh, some of our uh, partners in india when i say partners i mean my business partners uh, we have only a few suppliers in india and uh, you know i think uh, they have been supporting all of us uh, rather each of us have been supporting the don't sell to others uh, the kind of jewelry which we import from them so there is a little bit of a myth in our jewelry and that's the reason of our success also to our friends from india who have been supplying good jewelry to those people who have uh, not been supplying to me or from whom uh, we have not been buy i would say that uh, there is a, a market for everything and uh, um, i i don't think we should be desperate and my only advice would be please do not undersell your pricing because you see what happens is when the market is uh, slow they start undercutting the prices even at cost they start selling and it becomes very difficult to uh, increase the uh, the pricing once uh, we have already reduced it so uh, that would be the only thing and i think there is a very good scope we have to be innovative as has been said by my other friends uh, uh, and we have to find ways in which we can reach our customers if the customers cannot reach us and that is what we have started doing here we have started showing jewelry by zoom to our customers who cannot travel to us and uh, they cannot travel but uh, there is a brings there is a g4s uh, they are their services are available so we have been able to send the jewelry to them by showing them on uh, on the uh, through the net online and uh, taking the orders and giving the orders and similarly we have been uh, importing also based on the online orders which we are receiving from our customers we have ordered to our exporters and they have been exporting so i think the cycle has started and i see a bright future i am not desperate at all i am very very confident of our jewelry thank you 
Sunil ji, you are already in this space, okay? And you have been there for a few years and you've created quite a brand yourself. What is your advice to the uh, exporters from India on how to go about this particular aspect of the business? Uh, this is a good question, Himan Bhai. Uh, we have been able to create our own brands and we see that the, if the brands are there with uh, uh, meaningful attributes and if we stay honest to those attributes, so there's aspirational value in the brands for consumer in consumers' mind. So they come back for the same brand knowing that they can expect certain quality in those brands. So even having household uh, our in-house brands has been valuable for us. And the percentage of sales coming from in-house brands has been going up for us. And as Ashish Bhai said, what we have done is also a partner with certain outside designers to create brands for them. We manufacture ourselves in our factories in India and China, and they come on air or on a, online, we sell uh, on our platforms with their name. So they, that again creates a, a aspirational value in those brands. Now, as Ashish Bhai said, it is not easy to create brand out of India and sell in US and UK, because it's pretty expensive to create brand awareness for a new brand to come. So I would agree with Ashish Bhai's advice is to partner with a name brand or name there or designer there, or maybe uh, uh, buy an old brand which is struggling and then go to the market with that brand. Uh, you see the, uh, the jewelry market size in US has continually increased over the last 10, 12 years ever since the financial crisis, so low to mid single digits. But uh, brand, uh, the branded share has gone up more than the the jewelry growth rate. Right. And there's another uh, statistics I was reading for preparing for this meeting, is that the wedding rate in US has steadily gone down. So in 1982, there were 10.6 weddings per 100,000, uh, per thousand people in, U in US. Has gone, gone down to 6.5 in 2018. So the wedding rate has gone down consistently, but the jewelry market has gone up. So in my opinion, the market has changed from bridal to the other types of markets. Uh, as the other speaker said, the personalized jewelry has gone up. Uh, we feel that too. The occasion jewelry has gone up. The uh, birth rate or the initials or uh, the zodiac sign jewelry or storied jewelry, for example, we sell uh, the branded jewelry uh, with the designer's name. So the market, uh, a shape has changed. So partnering with a, a designer here or an old brand would be a good way to go forward because a bridal as such or OEM business as such will squeeze the margins. I, I quite agree. Uh, the branded promise, especially among the millennials and the youngsters today carries a lot of value yeah. and therefore they are willing to splurge or pay a better margin than you would find for the general unbranded material. I quite agree with you. At this stage, I'd like to take a question which may not be something that everybody wants to discuss, but which is at the top of my mind. And this question starts with Chirag. Chirag, how do you see the role of lab-grown diamonds in the future of the jewelry business? Um. I mean, uh, from what I uh, know, uh, I mean, I'm quite new to the to the industry still, but um, I think the the American diamonds or the cubic zircons that we usually say they were, I think, costing a lot, but eventually down the line, the prices came down. Um, and the same level of questions have been raising in terms of the CBD uh, rough pricing. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong, the, the demand is still going to be there. The, I, I feel the, the, especially in jewelry, the, the parallel business uh, is still going to be there. Uh, people are still, I mean, in US especially, people have already started uh, you know, buying uh, 
the series is lab grown diamond at the end i feel it's still a man made diamond it's not a natural diamond the the attachment that needs to be there is not there when we talk about a lab grown diamond um i mean um in in longer period i don't see uh, a natural diamond getting especially the the when i say not that much uh, the the larger stones or the certified stones i don't see it getting affected a lot smaller parcels like you know star melis plus 11s and all those things i i see they might be affected up to certain level and i think we've seen that already in last one or two years that the prices of the natural smaller parcels have gone down uh, but i don't see it going down any further than this i mean people who want to buy natural are still uh, going to buy natural they don't they don't uh, go behind a lab grown diamond that okay fine lab grown diamond is cheaper let me let me buy it no the the the, the sentiment is still there towards the natural diamond Ashish, what is your take on this? Lab grown is definitely here, and it is going to stay, and it is going to grow, absolutely. It will find its own niche on the retail counter, where it will coexist with the natural diamond uh, jewelry, and obviously, uh, consumer uh, understands also because of the mass media and social media. Consumer has the awareness of what is the difference between natural diamond and my uh, natural mine diamond as well as the lab grown diamond. and uh, at the same time as long as and because of the technology which has come which is to detect the natural separate and uh, uh, lab grown separate that technology has helped to create clear any kind of confusion which was there in the mind of any of the people in the pipeline whether it was a retailer or a consumer so as long as we continue with that uh, differentiation uh, both the product line is going to be differentiated i think natural diamonds share may go little down because lab grown will grow Uh, but at the same time i personally feel lab grown will take away some share of uh, cubic zirconia jewelry as well so but definitely it is going to stay and it is going to grow further from here on uh, sunil ji can i ask you this question you have the pulse of the end consumer all the time you know it best from all of us sitting here what is your what is your take on the lab grown diamond and the consumer interest and reaction Uh, having seen the example of lab grown ruby sapphire emerald they have been in, with us for uh, decades and that has not impacted natural ruby sapphire emerald in any way so that business or the value of those have continued to go, uh, go up over the decades so i suspect similar tra- trajectory for lab grown diamond as well it will coexist along with natural with the clear detection ability uh the consumer won't be confused and that would not impact our natural diamond business but uh as has happened with natural uh, lab grown ruby sapphire emerald the prices continue to go down to the uh, marginal cost of the lab grown precious stones because there is nobody who makes the market and the supply is uh, sort of unlimited the prices will continue to go down so it will not be seen as an investment product as natural diamond is seen it will be seen as a fashion product similar to what dbs has done with their light box they are creating it is as a fashion line and i see that happening more and more with the prices continue to go down but them they will coexist along with natural can i ask you one very specific question sunil ji what is the current sentiment of the consumer when it comes to lab grown diamonds according to you so initially there was a confusion uh, but uh, people are uh, coming to accept it more and more so this is a product line uh, that is there in the market and there is a clear differentiation in that so uh, if people declare it openly or the, or the retailers declare it openly then the consumer accepts it and many people uh, who believe in uh, sustainability they go go for it some people go for cost reason Uh, so there are different uh, uh, motivation for the uh, consumer to go for it. As I said, it will coexist, uh, but you, it won't. It won't be an investment uh, commodity that the natural diamond is. Do you do you today 
promote any lab grown diamond jewelry on your uh, channel no i because uh, we when we sell a product we sell it uh, based on it will either sustain the value either it is a fashion product which is below 100 dollar so that is sold as a fashion if we sell something in gold or with natural stone we sell it as a uh, reservoir of value okay. and the lab grown diamond we don't say we can't say the reservoir of value because i believe it will continue to go down in value so uh, chandu bhai let hemant me bhai, ask hemant bhai i i have i have an opinion on this yes of course chandu bhai i believe uh, we are all uh, trying to hide it under the carpet i don't think uh, the lab grown diamonds are going to be only a fashion product i think uh, even for diamond jewelry for example if somebody buys a diamond jewelry today and they want to sell it back they will not get more than 30 40% of what they paid so there is no investment value in that also so i think over a period of time both of them will coexist as nil by said and uh, uh, both of them will be preferred by different class of people but mm -hmm. when you go uh, for the higher sizes as has been said by my other colleague that it may not impact i think it will impact very well because a uh, bigger lab grown diamond will always be more better than a similar looking or similar size uh, a uh, diamond which is a natural diamond and uh, the price difference is going to be very huge when it comes to the bigger stones so yeah. i believe people who are on the fringe and want to invest as a x amount of dollars and uh, they they have only that many dollars they would prefer to buy the bigger size of diamonds because nobody is going to hang a certificate with their jewelry that okay, this is a lab grown or this is a natural diamond so uh, i think for the millennials it is going to become a uh, statement to wear bigger diamonds and they may not be able to afford the uh, natural diamonds so the demand for the uh, lab grown diamonds is going to increase this is my personal belief and uh, i i i i think very strongly in it okay. you, you were asked, asking me a question now you were yeah, asking so me. you have preempted the, you have already answered the question i was going to ask at that time but now i have another question for you yeah. considering the current scenario chandubai as an yeah. importer what is your wish list about the kind of product services etc that you want the indian exporter to offer uh i i have only one wish list tell me the indian exporter hmm. if he continues to be an exporter and does not open his own office in the foreign cities and uh, comes and sells it at the indian cost the export will increase <coughs> see today what is happening is many of our exporter brothers what they are doing is they are opening offices outside the country and then selling at the same price so they are actually killing the market they are not creating a market they are killing the market and as has been rightly said by one of our uh, uh, in the chat box i saw that uh, people are exporting at very low cost and uh, uh, they are exporting directly to the retailers also in other countries so thereby the wholesalers who were actually becoming the uh, the supplier for that exporters and his own office in a different country are going out of business so increasingly people will start losing their interest in the wholesale business because the wholesalers are funding the business you see the exporters are getting their money within a specific time the wholesalers are actually funding their business which is uh, 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 funding the retailers to have the stocks so you see when we cut out one wholesaler uh the retailers will be having a problem with the stocks and the uh, exporter will have to uh, start funding it and then there could be bad debts also so i believe if all of us stick to our rules there is a margin and there is a place for everybody as far as the indian wish list is concerned i just wish that the indian government becomes a little more pro proactive and they start uh, following what they have been always saying ease of doing business there is uh, still a lot to be done in the ease of doing business the moment india starts at okay you can bring in gold deposit at the airport put it at the customs okay you go out you buy your jewelry give the instructions to the customs or to prince or g4s to deliver that many kilos of gold to that uh, exporter things will become very very easy and uh, many more uh, i think foreign companies will come and set up bases in india because uh, they uh, you see the cost of their operation is going to be maybe one third of europe or half of europe so i don't see any reason why they should not be allowed uh they they should not come there also one more thing is in the uh, export oriented units where many uh, foreigners are setting up or would like to set up uh, uh the government should give some permission to sell a part of it to the local trade also 
uh, to the local market. So what happens is if a, a manufacturer set up his unit in a, a free zone, for example, okay, and he's exporting, uh, sometimes if the export market is not good, he should be allowed to sell a part of his product to the local markets also. Then there will be a boom because then people will be more attracted to come to India, invest in larger uh, amounts uh, in technology, everything, because they will get a part access to the Indian markets also, which is very difficult right now. So I think it can be a win-win if the government starts uh, putting all the uh, policies in place uh, to make it as easy to do business. I, I agree. But coming to the last point that you mentioned, Ashish, I'd like your feedback. I thought that the SEZs are allowed to sell a certain part of their production to the domestic market. Uh, yeah, but at a very uh, higher duty. So that makes it economically unviable. Uh, yeah. I get it. Okay, so uh, now, uh, Chandubai, you made a point which I did not originally include as my plans for questions tonight. But since this is the second time you have made the plan, I want to ask, starting with Ankit, Ankit, what do you think are the government benefits that you desperately want to grow your business, say, threefold in the next three years? Uh, um... Why oh, that long <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, as I said, I did originally want to get into this aspect. No, but it's a very important thing to discuss. Yeah, it's a very important thing to discuss. Yeah. What's the wish list for, uh, from the government to increase our business? So I'm deviating. I'm hitting everybody below the belt because I not told them I wouldn't be asking anything like this. But, no, but I, you know, I honestly think I'm looking, just kind of, you know, running through it in my head and... Uh, uh, I, I honestly don't feel uh, any particular uh, thing uh, can be or should be changed uh, rather than uh, making things a lot easier when it comes to exports, when it comes to the customs. Uh, that would be a lot more uh, beneficial. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, the rest, I feel, uh, you know, the GST returns and all, uh, were an issue before uh, uh, the duty part which they block uh, and the return didn't come, refund didn't come in time. I think that's a lot more smoother, but I feel the, the nitty gritties of basic export when it comes to the customs and all um, and blocking the bonds and not releasing them, that's more of an issue rather than any other uh, thing that I'm thinking of, honestly. Okay. Ashish, what is your take on this, please? I think I would say we are in SEZ, so we are quite comfortable uh, along with the custom rules and procedures, etc. But I would say there are only two things. I would say that uh, labor laws of the country needs to go for a reform because there are, con you know, we are in a position not to approach certain high-end brands based on the certain laws that prevails in the country. And so far we are selling into a mid-market segment, but there is, you know, there is all the reason that why any manufacturer shouldn't be selling to Tiffany or Cartier in that particular location okay but uh, we have all the capabilities and we have all the technology and we have all the artisans but uh, certain labor laws and certain ease of uh, importing certain parts uh, like ceramics and stuff like that that we are not allowed to do it in the zone that kind of stuff should be allowed so that will help and boost i would say that is the only thing i would say that uh, that is required to boost Kirag, what is your take on this uh, I think Ankit and Ashish have already answered, but yeah, I would say the same. I mean, the main thing is labor law and, uh, I mean, customs uh, making it easy to actually send the shipment. And because you see, I mean, uh, even during the pandemic, even during this time, I'm seeing that, you know, with example, if with my client, I have a, you know, uh, a payment terms of 10 days my shipment is still in India for seven days. You know, when it should be reaching my client at least in two days, the, the, the shipments are still lying in customs office. So, I mean, how do, I mean, the client, and then, and then the client is like, you know what, Chirag, I'll just source it locally. You don't bother shipping. You know, yeah. so, so all these, I mean, it should be made easier, especially du during these difficult times. But uh, I mean, I don't see much but help Chirag, in terms of customs. Chirag, to be fair, the way I look at it is that these are difficult times even for the customs and the government. 
uh, there is a manpower shortage. There are various things. I, I mean, I have been in conversation with some of the customers right. because I do talks for them also. Right. And they are also under a lot of stress. Like they stop imports for two days so that the exports can be cleared. And there are various things. But when they stop imports, then the factories stop. Right. You know, right. it's a chain reaction. No, but I mean, in terms of requiring the documents, I mean, it should be made easier. Like one document and the export should be done. So not that, like... What not are the like long term? 10, 15, that, yeah, not like 10, 15 documents of the correct. same thing. That uh, uh, you that know, I mean, uh, so yeah, that, that is something. Yeah. Sunilji, you are one person who has a finger in every pie. You are a manufacturer in India, you are a manufacturer in China, you are a wholesaler, and you are a retailer with a B2C channel. What what is it that you would say the Indian government or the Indian uh, custom should change so that your business, the way you are operating, becomes better? I think uh, there have been a reduction in uh, red tapeism in the last few years. So that is a welcome change. And as Ashish Bhai said, uh, for the easier uh, labor reforms, uh, now, as we put more restriction to not to fire people, you tend not to hire people. And uh, having that flexibility, like there is such a similar flexibility in Western world, would be beneficial for labor uh, themselves. I, I know labor is a state as well as federal subject. It has, is a concurrent list. But states can make a change, and many states have made a change in India. But if federal law can come, that will spur the reform in that sector. From the customs point of view, I think it is a continual process, as Chirag Bhai said. Uh, less of red tape will definitely help uh, because uh, uh, as you make it easier for people, the, the trade really flourishes. Right. Okay. Now, before we sign off, uh, um, Ashok Bhai, do I have at least five, seven minutes more? You have another hour if you want. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, guys, anybody willing to delay the shots, let's go on with the thoughts. <laughs> anyway, I, I won't take a long time, but I really want to ask this question. I have one question which I want to ask after you. No, no, go ahead. After you. No, go. no, no, after you. Okay, so I have this one question that I have consistently felt, maybe I'm a pessimist, maybe I'm, I'm not looking at the right side and way of things, but I have consistently felt that over the past few years, especially after the Godfather, and we all know whom I refer to, walked out of the room and stopped advertising. The business has been on a slow but a steady decline. I want to hear each one of your thoughts on how, as I said, we can get back that lost glory. And as Ashish mentioned, the lost share of the wallet of the consumer. Whoever wants to start, whoever wants to I, 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 I can talk on that if you yes, would like, uh, permit me. Okay. You see, uh, there used to be a time when uh, the World Gold Council had its agenda for uh, the support to jewelry. Okay. And uh, they were supporting uh, the advertising for jewelry all over the world, especially in India and the Middle East also. Uh, last, uh, I think, about 10 or 15 years ago, or 12 years maybe, uh, they have uh, changed their track for the international market. They are going only for the, uh, mainly, I would say, uh, for uh, the government uh, holding of gold. So they are promoting that in a very big way. So uh, there is no body which actually wants to promote the sale of jewelry. You see, uh, what is happening today is the millennials... The, the millennials, they find that, okay, jewelry, my mother used to talk as investment and um, store of value and all. Today, I want to buy something small and I want to wear it, enjoy it and forget all about it. But you see, many people now have realized and I think we should all join hands today. And uh, this COVID has made everybody realize that there are some things which have value and that value will remain forever. And that is jewelry. Okay, so the moment we all join hands and start this uh, process of saying in each and every advertisement of jewelry, be it you, be it me, be it anybody, that jewelry is an investment. 
the moment we all start putting this message across the world that jewelry is an investment, I think people will start looking at us in a different light. And that is what we need to do as groups, as individuals. Everybody has to talk about our item. This is the only item in the world where you will get a fair value, which you can assess by yourself. You know how much you will get. Be it diamond jewelry, be it gold jewelry, be it any jewelry. There is a resale value. You buy uh, the most expensive purse and you take it out of the showroom, you won't even get 20% of that. Okay, so I think this is what we need to do. We all jointly need to uh, promote this. Right. Who wants to go next? Ashish? I have, I have uh, yes, something to add. Uh, what yes, Chandubai please. said, uh, you know, that, that, is a, that is what we as a youngsters do keep on saying that we as a diamond and jewelry industry have to realize that, you know, our, our com competition is not the companies within the industry. Correct. Our competition is mainly all these you know, iPhones and Apple, Apples and Samsungs and LVs and, you know, because I mean, if we don't work as an industry, we are going to lose clients. And that's what we've seen. I mean, people, especially in US, I mean, I mean, I, I was there for three years and I've seen during those Black Fridays and stuff, people stand in line to get those TVs and mobiles and from you know, one night prior, two nights prior, they they sleep there, and so you know that kind of hype. We we do need to, you know, create in diamond jewelry, so that people, I mean, you know, especially the youngsters do at least, uh, you know, go make some effort to buy. I agree with you, completely agree. Yeah. Ashish, can I take? So you I think yeah yeah sure. Yeah. So I think once Big Daddy left uh, our industry in terms of retail advertisements. Uh, over last decade, I would say the only company who really did something was Pandora, who yeah. created a product differentiation and also did the kind of the advertisement that was needed to boost the jewelry. Yes, it helped themselves, but at the same time, it also attracted young consumers to come back to the stores. Uh, that's what I noticed probably in the international market. Uh, however, we as a diamond and jewelry industry, because our margins are not that great, or probably we ourselves undersell our product. Because of that, we are not investing back into creating something which is a brand itself. So when I made a statement that we would like to make a coexistence with a successful brand, the only reason is that our margins are not great enough and we are kind of having a fear of underselling our own products. <laughs> yes, I agree with you. Margins is something that I have been questioning for a few years, not few years, many, many years. But for some reason, we've never got beyond it. Uh, we have been always thinking as uh, not creators of even product, but just uh, manufacturers and sellers. There's a difference, yeah. if you understand Correct. what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Anyway, uh, uh, Sunil Bhai, uh, Sunil Ji, what is your take on this? So, uh, as Ashish Bhai rightly said, uh, the place that DBS left. Sorry, I'm I'm uh, I'm blunt, so I'm saying the name. Sure, sure, sure. So the the gap that DBS left has to be filled in by other other large players. The uh, why uh, the other player other industry has advertised because they are really large companies, and the jewelry industries don't have many large players. So that is why I support the LVMH taking over uh, Tiffany. You get creates a larger player who have the financial wherewithal to create that consumer pull uh, by marketing. And as Ashish Bhai said, uh, partnering with brands to create that marketing uh, campaigns, which can be, um, which can get the consumer mind share away from uh, iPods of the world or iPads or uh, iPhones of the world. So us be, uh, partnering together or outside is the only solution I see. The trade bodies like World Gold Councils or German Jewelry Council, I don't believe that is a solution. Solution is for us to become larger as a group or partner within the like-minded people to create the brands or a uh, or, uh, uh, brand together with a designer and with two or three large players partner to create a common brand and, and advertise for those brands. That is the only way I see it practically. Others, others is wishful thinking. Completely agree. Uh, 
Ankit, what is your take on it when it comes to plain gold jewelry? How do you see it? Um, um, in general, any jewelry, I feel uh, in the investment part um, um, is something that we've been kind of hitting at for the last, I think, 15, 20 years, and rightfully so. And it's probably going to have another parabolic rise, and people understand that. Um, I think uh, if you are creating a brand, like people are seeing a iPhone and all, you know, kind of waiting for it to come out and, you know, sleeping on the roads the day before. What I feel is we might need to start reevaluating what is meaningful for life. Um, for that, I mean to say is, uh, you know, making them, uh, sending out as a jeweler uh, community, sending out ads which kind of cater to the brand of jewelry, saying that, you know, you need to buy that to feel good about themselves, to express affection and appreciation for the loved ones. And, and uh, you know, in these challenging times and, and furthermore. So if we start doing that and not only, uh, you know, hit on investing, investment part of it, I think it is going to be a lot more helpful for this uh, younger generation that's going to come forward. Because that's what they want. They want, they want something that's meaningful for life now. And I think if those kind of ads keep on coming, people will start buying jewelry. So, you know, before I end, I'd like to make one comment here, which I had made very recently on another platform where I was giving a talk to some jewelry people. Is that uh, people my age still would go and think of jewelry as one of my preferred purchases because I had seen the De Beers ads and the heavy advertisement that were going on at that time. My children have never seen those ads. And for them, jewelry has never been something that has been there on their wish list or even something that they desire remotely. Okay. In fact, uh, I know people, I know my own daughter who was not never keen about jewelry even when she got married. Okay. So that's the thing. And I'd like to, one, one particular thing that I have been telling people for over 10 years now is that promotions and advertisements are very essential. It's, and the example that I always give them is that if you wink at a girl in the dark, she's not going to see anything and therefore she's not going to respond. To it. And when you don't promote and don't advertise, it is like winking at the most beautiful girl on earth, but in the dark. She doesn't know you're making a pass at her. Okay. So we really need to think about this aspect for the future of the industry. And I think there are ways and some of the things that uh, Sunil Bhai said, that uh, Chandu Bhai said, and all of you all agree on is something that we need to really think and take for. Uh, I would now like to hand over to Ashok Bhai to take the questions from the audience. Uh, I, Ashok Bhai, I have a question. Okay. Am I audible? Yes, yeah, yeah. I am. Yeah. Uh, the question is that in today's time, when uh, there are not a lot of customers who are coming in to our shop, and uh, a lot of jewelry, in spite of uh, uh, in spite of uh, the pandemic, there is a uh, some amount of jewelry which is being sold. Uh, so, what is the way? Uh, is the virtual way correct way of doing business? And why we as jewelers haven't been very successful in this format? And what are the ways that we can be successful? Uh, who would like to take that? Uh, so I would I think, just share yeah. with some experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not a, I'm a manufacturer on a backend side. I'm not a retailer selling to any consumers. But during these pandemic times, we created a sting at home for one of our retail partner, a created a kind of a campaign at the backend where all the photographs and digital media was supported by us. They were representing it to their consumers on Zoom and um, maybe some Microsoft Teams and various apps. And they were inviting uh, their consumers to virtually look into it, sending it to them to uh, experience it. And then they converted a huge kind of a success during this pandemic as well. Com because they never had a digital presence earlier. So obviously for them, every additional sale was like an additional sale. But that's how they created using this particular tool. And we on the backend side supported them with all the uh, digital uh, media uh, and the photos and on everything else. So maybe so something. Why is it that, that, uh, why is it that uh, the, the jewel jewelers are not actually getting successful anywhere? 
very well you this was a great example of what you said of success uh, during the covid time yeah but on the why are people not getting into the virtual idea so easily in the jewelry segment or in the in the even in the loose stone segment if you really look at people are really not getting into the virtual segment is it is there something lacking uh, in the in the way it is being marketed or is there something which is uh, not in the right perspective so i would like the panelists to right. answer this but i am right. also going to attempt to answer it later on ashok bhai so sure, please please go ahead who is starting from the panel I, I don't mind taking that yeah. uh, i believe i believe uh, the uh, virtual you see when you buy jewelry jewelry more is more about feeling it is the feel you see you want to see because every piece of jewelry every diamond every stone is going to be different no two stones will be same even when you have a certificate you see you have a uh, vvs uh, uh, g color certificate even two stones of that will be different so that is the reason a customer generally wants to see the stone so what can be done is you can approach the customer you can make them aware of your product you can have that engagement with them and but the final sale happens when they visit you because they want to touch and feel it now in uh, in some of the uh, european countries in america for example there is a lot of uh, mail order businesses which happen so the uh, the jewelry is sent uh, to the customer they try it on if they are not happy they return it back but that is not very pre prevalent in india because you see many people would take advantage of that they will wear the jewelry for one occasion and return it the next day so that is the reason many jewelers have not actually tried to market that too much they have tried but not too much it was as a back burner side okay hoga to hoga nahi hoga to no problem because they had fantastic sales on their own showrooms but now more and more people are looking at it so i believe in times to come it will change and uh, it will change for the better right anybody else wants to take that up sunil ji the master yeah so we uh, we are already virtual and digital since the last 14 years and uh, so uh, what can i say yes i agree with he's you. already done it okay <laughs> i am i want to address this question ashok bhai with your permission there are two aspects to this one of the reasons why jewelers have never really created something different is because we are very comfortable in our zone we do not want to venture out and take a risk or put in that additional effort and in india specifically the problem has always been that we have always promoted and sold jewelry as an investment now when you are selling something as an investment you cannot demand or claim high margins because then that investment is not going to give returns to the buyer for a long long time and therefore we tend to sell cheap okay now because we sell cheap we cannot take risks and because of that and because you are in your comfort zone you do not try new products you do not try new designs you do not spend on marketing you do not spend on promotion on various things right now if you see and i as a consultant know because i am talking to so many people who want to go digital over the last 4 months is that it is become a necessity and that is why they want to do it okay in a few cases at least in three of the customers i'm talking to they thought that after listening to mind speak and kudos to you guys there after listening to mind speak they realized that they are missing out on a very important aspect and channel of distribution and therefore they want to get into it so it's a question of a mindset it's a question of how we have been brought up and trained we need to stop becoming traders and we need to become wealth creators actually this uh, question uh, hemant bhai started initiated because of our mind speak uh, webinars that we did on virtual uh, uh, right. selling if you really look at Absolutely. and Absolutely. i looked at all the alternatives but not a single alternative was actually or option was really satisfying uh, me and the way i i am looking like a buyer in the, when i sit in the shoes of a buyer you can you cannot really sell me that goods and i was thinking continuously why am i why why am i not able to satisfy or be okay with the, is is the feel factor so important and not why because 
if i myself am buying diamonds from the bdb offices of say one carat and below even without seeing them just by the way they are uh, displayed and with the with the turn table effect which is there the photographic effect which is available is so crystal clear that i do, though i read the certificate i can see the diamond exactly the way i want wanted to show and i just close the deal over the telephone now okay. this is not happening in the jewelry segment at all the they have actually made a big turn around in the diamond section well the turn around is not happening particularly in the jewelry section and i think this is uh, going to be one of the biggest challenges no i i see a big shift happening there ashok bhai because the way people are now trying to implement it the consumers will get used to it see any new implementation takes time even if you want to implement something within your own factory or your own office i have this 90 day rule you make a rule don't change it for 90 days listen to all the complaints and the challenges that your team brings to you but for 90 days continue with it because that is the time it takes for acceptance when you go to an international consumer community which is so huge that process is still slower but once people keep seeing it all the time once people see and what is going to happen also is that as they see it on a, a augmented reality and then they go into the shop and they realize that oh yeah this is how it looked on me even on the ar they are going to start accepting it so it's a gradual process which will have to be built in yes i agree with you uh, it is a process and i think it, it is also a science it is an element of science it is an a, a, a element of actually creating uh, a real virtual market uh, place which nobody has attempted to build so far and i think uh, the transparency and you know keeping to your word when when i say keeping to your word i have seen a lot in uh, uh jewelry businesses that you know when we say 7 days a lot of time that 7 days can easily go up to 11 or 12 days see that is where the the i mean uh, that hoti hai chalti hai doesn't work in today's world like you know if you say if you said 5 days it has to be 5 days this is where china is i mean you know moving ahead of us because when they promise it they are delivering it like you know so that that is where the i i i feel the the jewelry industry even in seeds i mean you know from import point of view also if i'm i'm, I'm telling my client that i'll get the piece in 5 days but i mean you know it's customs i don't know what is going to happen i mean clearing a uh, clearing my sample pieces and stuff so so you know there there are a lot of uh, things that i mean it's, you know it's all circle that one thing leads to another thing and so yeah so even though you can do the honors now if you feel uh, we have reached our well so i have a, i have one last question yeah yeah that's for for ankit uh, ankit uh, at this moment today exporters are not uh, uh, why don't you speak on the phone your voice is not coming yeah hold on hold on i will take it on the phone ओनली <laughs> So this question is for you, Ankit. So it's, uh, I think it's. I mean, it's quite uh, simple in the sense that uh, I mean, I've been practicing this uh, uh, for a long time. Uh, it's basically simple. When you the day when you are taking your rupee rate for the gold that you have purchased, um, at the same very time, uh, you make sure you do the export side and the the import side. the buy and the sell of the dollar at the same rate uh, and make sure that you are genuinely doing it regularly and not having your speculation come in the way where you must have heard something about two days ago saying that rupee abhi do rupee week hone wala hai so let's leave my you know kind of uh, the the amount open um, 
so that's where i think the usual thing happened otherwise uh, the all the banks have that uh, simple allowance to let the customers uh, book the import and the export side uh, at the same time uh, you know having the rupee hedge so that way you are just simply earning that uh, labor that you have uh, priced in for thank okay. you uh, thank you everybody it has been a fantastic session in fact i am just waiting for the recording to be sent to me so that i can go through the whole thing again all the panelists i really thank you for your candid frank honest and from sharing some of the ideas you have which can help the industry go forward in a big way uh starting with chirag chirag thank you for your thank insights you. thank you very much uh, ashish and uh, uh, ankit thank you for your insights into the jewelry aspect of thank you for having us thank you thank you for having us aman bhai chandubai and uh, uh, thank you very much for your insights i would love to stay connected and hear more from you and uh, sunil ji you. you are truly uh, you know i don't know what that god is with sure. five hands or 10 hands or whatever i'm not talking of 10 hands <laughs> i'm talking of 10 hands but you are like, really like that and i'd love to stay in touch with you and pick your brain some more Thank you very much, everybody. It has been a Thank wonderful you. session, and I'm looking forward to re-hearing and going deeper into what you have all taught us today. Thank you Thank all. You. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our side at Mind Speak. Uh, we come back again next Sunday at 6:30 p.m. again with another interesting subject, with another interesting list of speakers. So see you all again. Have a wonderful evening, and. Uh, Good afternoon. Goodbye. All the best. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And cheers. Thank you. Cheers, everybody. Amon, by your time starts now. Absolutely. Your time starts now. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. <laughs> bye, Dashish. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thank bye. you, Chand. Thank you, Chandu. Bye. All the best. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sunil Ji. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Chandu. Bye.